Hi everyone, today I'm here to talk about how to store your Bitcoin. A lot of folks are worried about, can hackers get to my Bitcoin? Who can I trust if I let them store my Bitcoin? It's a really nuanced conversation and I've been hodling for eight years. So today I'm gonna to dive into different methods to store your Bitcoin and different uh, mitigation strategies. There's no perfect way to do it, but let's go talk about the differences. I'm gonna shoot us over to my uh, article, how to, how to store your Bitcoin. This is from my newsletter. If you want to hear this first, it comes out on Thursdays. I'll include a link here to subscribe and a link below. Uh, but let's go ahead and dive in. All right. So like I mentioned, I've been doing this for eight years. It's been a long time. There are two ways to custody your Bitcoin. Self-custody, that means you store it yourself. You trust yourself with the password, aka private key. It's not the same thing as a private key, but for simplicity purposes, um, you know, essentially you have total control over it. But if you mess up, you're, you know, it's on you. And then there's custodial. Custodial is trusting a company like Kraken, where I work at Kraken, uh, Coinbase, Anchorage. These are all very trusted uh, trusted companies who have never been hacked and are in charge of storing uh, lots of coin for people. Not your keys, not your coins is a popular mantra in Bitcoin and crypto that advocates for self-custody. If you don't control the private key, the Bitcoin isn't 100% yours. Totally agree with this. This is exactly what you should strive to do. Conversely, your keys, your coins, which means you are solely responsible for the proper custody and storage of those coins. And the debate really comes down to, do you trust yourself or do you trust a company more? And the second point is, who are you trying to defend against? Exchanges are a honeypot for hackers and governments. Governments could go to certain exchanges and say, hey, I want you to freeze all these Bitcoin from these uh, citizens. But self-custody methods you know, conversely, so self-custody protects against those two attacks, but they're prone to mistakes or break-ins or natural disasters. If you have like a hurricane, earthquake, or house fire. Uh, in the following sections, I'm going to break down custodial versus non-custodial. So uh, for self-custody, this is the preferred way to store your Bitcoin. Oh, and by the way, there's some great content out here by uh, Ledger. So Ledger has great content around why it matters uh, that you have self-custody Casa has got a great blog of about private key management and all sorts of different content uh, pieces of content there. And then finally, BTC Sessions. He's a really awesome YouTuber. I definitely recommend you check out his channel. He's got tons of different playlists. He's tried out literally every piece of hardware and way to store, store your Bitcoin. For example, here's all the hardware to wallets out there that he has tutorials on. Awesome content. All right, so back to describing what self-custody is. So with self-custody, you're taking control, control of your Bitcoin, which is one of the main value props of why you'd want Bitcoin in the first place, is you can control it. The upside is that you're in complete control over the Bitcoin, no matter what the local dic, uh, local regulations dictate, right? Like, um, so if you securely store it and the government says Bitcoin's banned, you're kind of like, well, it doesn't matter. I, <laughs> I have total control over it. Um, and this is really advantageous. This is part of like wh why Bitcoin is valuable. But I think something that's not mentioned by a lot of prominent Bitcoiners is that the downside is they could lose all your Bitcoin if you don't store it properly. You know, this is, it's kind of like a loaded gun. Like you really need to understand what you're getting into. And this is nothing to play around with. If this is your whole life savings, you should take this very, very seriously. So like, a, for example, a common mistake is to overcomplicate the backup. The backup is a 12 to 24 word string. And that is what you can restore your wallet with if you were to lose your hardware device that has all your coin on it. Uh, but the thing is, if anyone finds your backup, they can take your coins. So because of this, Bitcoiners go down this elaborate, this whole uh, sort of rabbit hole of figuring out how to protect against that. And so they'll add a password on their backup and things can just get really complicated really quick. Also, you know, if you do this and I've been doing it for eight years, trust me, you're not going to remember a pin number for eight years. <laughs> um, you know, you unless you, I mean, you've got to really spend your time going back and double checking that you know it like every couple of months you got to try it again because if you don't use this password very often it's not going to be very memorable this isn't like a password that you use all the time which is a good thing because you don't want that to be your password or that or your pin number so you know i think like it's very complicated where you can go down this rabbit hole of like well then maybe you have two backups you know um <laughs> or maybe you write down the password to the backup somewhere else and and you can kind of quickly see how this becomes like kind of nesting dolls of complexity um, and so there's a I don't know what's perfect there but there's a sliding scale of usability and simplicity uh, and also security so another common mistake too is to have it written down on paper a lot of people write down their their backup on paper that can easily be lost you know your maid comes in throws it away your partner comes in doesn't know what it means 
or damaged water fire anything really it's paper right that, that i mean paper is like one of the weakest uh, substances out there to store information on the best way to do this by the way is to store it on a titanium backup which has the highest melting point out of any metal substrates that are used to store backups for example crypto tag this company is super sick so they have they stress test this stuff with uh, blow torches fires they shoot it it's incredible you know this can last almost anything it's literally indestructible almost indestructible it's not actually indestructible so you know there you can see them literally making them red hot and the information still all preserved there uh, it's a really great, beautiful product. I personally use CryptoTag. It's a little bit more expensive than everything else, sure. And you can also make this on your own. But if you want to spend the money and have something that's really amazing, then the CryptoTag is it. Yeah, here's them stress testing, getting it crushed. By the way, Jameson Lop, the co-founder of Casa, he has um, he, stre he stre stress tests all these metal backups that I'm, I'm mentioning, but CryptoTag by far is the best. So yeah, they, they go through the whole gamut here of like crushing it, putting it in fire. This is what, you, you know, for your life savings, this is what you want to store your money on. <laughs> Something that's going to survive all this. Um, they even shoot it. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's incredibly resilient. All right. So back, back to the article. If you want to know how to self-custody, the easiest way to do it. One, first you got to buy Bitcoin. I work at Kraken. You got to check that out. Once you buy your Bitcoin... You buy a hardware device. These hardware devices are cold storage, which means that they're not connected to the internet. Trezor is a great company. They've got a lot of great products. You can check them out here. They've got some pretty cheap ones. Um, you know, then once you get this, then you uh, back up your mnemonic on the crypto tag. So crypto tag again is this, uh, you can store your backup here. So pretty sweet. Uh, that's how you do it. And that's, that covers the self custody aspect, which is uh, how to custody Bitcoin on your own. All right, going over to custodial. So custodial is where you trust someone else to manage your money. Now, businesses that custody crypt, uh, custody Bitcoin range from incompetent like Mt. Gox that we've all heard about to highly competent and trusted to hold billions in Bitcoin. For example, Kraken. Kraken is extremely security focused. While I can't go into the exact protocols that we use, we've got our security page here where you can read about our security team, how we store our coins, different security testing that we do. Kraken has been around for 10 years and has never been had a never had a hack that led to a funds loss. So, you know, while you are trusting Kraken to secure your coin, these are very competent enterprises that are, are used to doing this. Um, Coinbase as well. So Coinbase is a qualified custodian. This means that they're specially accredited, accredited for institutional investors. Coinbase had a great blog post here by Brian, Brian Armstrong about five years ago around how they store their Bitcoin. They're also very, very security conscious and they get into some crazy sort of in the weeds knowledge on how they thought through it. So they go really deep into that here, which I think is super cool. So, um, and then you've also got Anchorage. So Anchorage is another qualified custodian and the first national bank to be approved by the OCC um, in the US. And they've got uh, some more information on their security methods here. So, you know, custody is becoming more and more sophisticated with greater and greater resiliency built in. Um, the early exchanges were prone to attacks and hacks all the time. Again, Bitcoin self-custody is the way to go. You want to store your own Bitcoin if you feel confident in it. If you don't feel very confident in it or don't feel very technical, then you might want to consider having some coins on these exchanges, but eventually try to put some goals to get your coins off of those exchanges into your own self-custody when you feel very comfortable with the process. Um, you know, the other risk as well, like if the government comes to these custodial companies like Crack and Coinbase or Anchorage and says, hey, freeze these coins, they likely will have to comply legally. So they can't they can't say no. So if you are on the wrong side of a political debut, uh, a dispute with your government, you could very well have your funds frozen. Uh, how to use them. Find one that you trust that you above through your reputable. Move your coins there and make sure if you do do this again, I can't stress enough that self-custody is the preferred method. But if you do do this. Make sure you set up non-SMS two-factor authentication, like authenticator from Google. Don't have them where you enter your password, have them send you a text. That's the wrong way to do it. Make sure you sign up for the method that has authenticator. That way, if someone hacks your phone, they can't get access to your Bitcoin. So in conclusion, when it comes to custody of my coins, my thoughts are around mitigating catastrophic risk. Whether that be with an exchange hack or state seizure of assets on custodial, exchange, on custodial venues, or forgetting my password or a house fire, self-custody. 
I'm not saying I'm storing my Bitcoin at my house. I'm just mentioning this for the general audience um, because a lot of folks do it that way. I don't, but a lot of folks do it that way. In order to reduce that risk, I actually split up my own between custodial and uh, self-custody just because I'm mitigating the risk that I get into a car accident. And I can't remember how to restore my Bitcoin. Um, you know, so there's, there's, a, there's no perfect way to do it. Long term, I think multi-sig is the best solution, which provides um, self-custody, but minim minimizing the self-custody risk. So with multi-sig, you have X pieces of a private key that you distribute amongst a certain number of parties. So these keys, uh, keys, uh, key uh, mechanisms are typically two out of three or three out of five. So two out of three would require two out of three keys to move the Bitcoin. With a three out of five, it requires three out of the five keys to move Bitcoin. However, the ex user experience here still isn't great. It's still being worked out. Like for example, who controls the third, fourth, or fifth key? If you control one key and the business controls one key, you know, how do you think about the other keys? Like, do you give them to family members? Most family members don't know how to store Bitcoin properly or do self custody. Do you trust other companies then with the other keys? This is where it can get complicated. And I don't think, I don't think it's impossible to figure this out, but I haven't seen anyone do it really, really elegantly. So far, the best solutions are Casa. Uh, Casa has got a great, Way to it's a, a more uh, I think one of the more popular um, more popular multi sig uh, storage services and then also um, Unchained Capital Unchained Capital is also a great company to do this as well so ultimately like what it's coming down to is do you trust yourself and what attacks what do you how much do you trust yourself and what attacks are you trying to protect against and that's why I don't think there's a perfect answer to this. I do think that you should strive to self custody if you trust yourself and you should get comfortable enough to at some point that you do. That's the way to do it. But at the same time, maybe you keep a little bit on a custodial exchange just in case a really traumatic accident happens to you or something like that. Hope you enjoyed this. If you do, uh, give me a like, give me a subscribe and uh, stay tuned next week. Cheers.